Well, way back in 1931, actually, which is pretty far back for the Soviet Union, and they came to us as being the leading electronic organization, they thought, of the world, and wanted to get technical information from us and, and pay for it. And, and they did come, and they did pay for it quite, quite well. And we were willing to give it to them because Sarnoff got the approval of the Army and the Navy and the State Department. Uh, there was no Air Force that was, that was part of the Army at that time. He got approval to do this, and we did, and, and we had the engineers both come to us, and I went to Russia to interchange t technical information. Then, years later, they came to us again in 1937. This time they wanted to make it a much bigger deal, acquire a greater amount of information, uh, and pay very well for it again. And again, Sarnoff got the approval of the Army uh, and the Navy and the State Department. Um, but this time Sarnoff said, I won't sell you just technical know-how. Uh, he was a little skeptical, perhaps, of Stalin and various things going on in Russia. Uh, he said, you must also buy at least a million dollars worth of equipment. Well, we thought they might just buy a million dollars worth of photo photographs or something else that might be used in Russian homes. Not at all. They wanted to buy the most modern television equipment that we could make so that they could say they had the best television in the world. So we did make it for them, a little better than what we had on the Empire State Building, which was the best until that time. And I had charge of 12 engineers that went to Russia to install the equipment and get it operating. It took almost a year. We got it done. We got paid for it. Uh, uh, the whole thing was a very unusual venture, but it gave Russians a start in television, uh, which I still think probably paid off later on when Gorbachev announced Glasnost and television became the means of communication to Russians of what's going on in Russia and elsewhere in the world. Certainly some of the know-how used in making television, and they did make their own, came from the instruction we gave them under this large contract way back in the 1930s. Where did you set up the equipment? Where did you set up your transmitter? Uh, that was set up at a location near the outskirts of Moscow using an old radio tower 330 feet high made of rusted, discarded railroad rails. That's what the tower was made of. It was extremely strong because railroad rails are very strong. Um, we, we set it up there and after much difficulty and much red tape uh, and much problem with the purges going on and uh, much inability to communicate with the Russians except the engineers we worked with and various friends of ours were imprisoned while we were there. Uh, three of the people that signed the RCA contract to get us there, uh, we found when we got there, one had been shot before we even arrived in Russia. One was shot, according to the embassy, while we were there. And the third man that had to sign off the contract hesitated a long time, but he did sign it off and we did get paid for it. We were there at the very peak of the purges when some 20 million people were imprisoned and some 10 million were killed, mm -hmm. executed. Most of them at the time were there. We were there during the peak of the purges. Were you being followed at all by the KGB? Were they keeping careful tabs on where you were? I, I, I was followed, uh, yes. Uh, at one rather humorous occasion, I went out to ski at a place near to the embassies at Dacha, which means their country establishment. I was being followed by the woman assigned to follow me. She had a car, which meant she had a, a person of high rank. Uh, so when I went out to the ski area, she followed me. When I went skiing, she went skiing. So then we skied together. It's very unusual to ski together with the person assigned to spy on you. Uh, then after we finished skiing, I decided to go into the nearby American dacha, uh, the country place, which is very secretive, very carefully guarded, always carefully debugged, and never had had any, any Russian official in it. Nevertheless, I made the mistake, rather foolishly, of inviting her to come into the dacha for a few minutes, and she did. The minute she entered, all conversation stopped. Everyone could tell just by the, the aura of her identity, namely KGB. Uh, I took her out shortly, but she had a big feather in her cap. She could tell her associates that she had been to the, into the American Embassy, Dacha, had talked to important foreign officials, uh, and really had accomplished a, a real coup, a big feather in her cap. That was a mistake I made that probably paid off later. 
because I had trouble with the KGG at a later date, serious trouble, uh, and it could be that she came to my rescue in court with a friend in court. I'm not sure, but it could be that that mistake in rigging her into the Dasha paid off at a later time. What kind of trouble did you have? I don't want to get into, into details. I had reason to smuggle a girl into the embassy at night. Um, I went up the back steps to see the man I wanted to see in the embassy, the one that she wanted to see. I, I succeeded in that. I'm sure the girl was not detected by the KGB going in or out of the embassy because she was curled up on the back of my, on the floor of the back of my car so that no guards could see her as I drove in. Nevertheless, next day she called weeping and said they called me last night and told me if I again enter the American embassy, I will be treated accordingly, which means imprisonment. So I was discovered, and the fact that I'd broken down the internal security of the Russian system was bad for me too. And I talked to the military attaché of the embassy, Colonel Faymanville, and he took a dull view. He said, you may be in serious trouble. I will check on you the next several days to see if you're around. Well, I was, and it may be that the girl that I invited into the Dacia became my friend in court when the hearing, so to speak, undoubtedly came up the following day. What did the Russians hope to, what kind of television did they have in mind? What, what did they want to use their system for? for? For the same thing we did, except probably with a greater emphasis on propaganda than on, and then on entertainment, but the same, the same kind of thing. And they, and they were very smart when they, when they had their first 200 receivers. We furnished 200 ourselves made in this country before they began to making them over, over there. They put them not only in the homes of prominent wealth and wealthy Russians, which they did, but also in school auditoriums and other public places so the public could see television for the first time in its life and see that Russia was, again, after all, the greatest nation in the world because it had television. The, the, these were used for public benefit, and pub, for propaganda benefit, uh, not just in the homes of the wealthy. Did they say they were the only country in the world that had television? No, but they made, they, they made that out. They managed to refrain from saying the television that came from abroad. Did they, do you remember what kinds of things they were broadcasting? Were they broadcasting yeah. ballet or ballet, music? Ba ballet, uh, dancing, uh, other kinds of acting, uh, plays, that sort of thing. Yeah. Which they did very well. The Russians, after all, have been pretty good at ballet for a long time. Uh, and uh, they could put on programs better than we could from the very beginning. Some of the programs I saw were better than I'd ever seen in this country at that time. Amazing. So now, so there were 200 sets in Moscow, solely in Moscow. You yes. didn't set up a transmitter anyplace else. No. Sole transmitter. No. And it wasn't repeating at this point. There was no network at this point. So. No. What do you think the America's interest was in selling this? Was this strictly a business deal, or was there an interest that this country had in helping Russia set up its television system? Uh, it could have been both. I, I don't know the actual expressed view of the State Department. It may have been, uh, yes, do this, do this, and to establish better rapport with the Russians, uh, and this will help do it, so carry through on this contract. That may have been their viewpoint. I think it was, but I'm not certain. Well, I know that certainly when we were over there and, and we had very close rapport and great friendship with the people in the embassy, they were terribly lonely because they weren't able to speak to Russians and uh, we would, would have been lonely without them. So we and the embassy people got together very intimately. I, I practically became an embassy personnel. But I found that all of them were glad that the Russians were putting in television. They thought it was a good thing toward, toward world communication.